Right, let me test that. How does that sound? Can everyone hear me? Brilliant. My name is Liz Hunt. I'm Deputy Editor of The Telegraph. And um, it's a great pleasure to be here today. Also quite a frightening um, uh, challenge with my four distinguished guests um, who are going to debate the question, how should culture be valued by politicians? And how does it contribute to GDP and Britain's sense of identity? In many ways, it's a hoary old chestnut of a debate, but it never quite goes away. Um, and today, we're going to give it new life um, with our panelists. I don't know whether that's the way, right way to describe them, but that's. Let me start by introducing uh, Sir John Tusa, who is um, a former head of the uh, Barbican and currently chair of the Claw Leadership Programme in Arts. Um, after an illustrious career in the BBC, he has spent probably the last 30 years or so at the centre of the arts establishment. Is that about right? Um, Not establishment. <laughs> I hate to think. No, no, no. Don't want to be I, thought, I knew I'd get into trouble with that word. No, right. um, he's also the author of Pain in the Arts, which is a passionate defence. Sorry, note, note the spelling. <laughs> Um, if anyone, my pr pronunciation wasn't clear enough, a passionate defence of the visual and performing arts at a time of ever greater hardship, hardship in funding. Um, on my left, Jesse Norman, who many of you will know as the home turf representative here today, Conservative MP for Hereford and South Herefordshire. Uh, an independent-minded politician, I think it's fair to say. He's a former director of Barclays, and I throw that in because he knows about money, and money is part of this debate. Uh, he's, and has served his time in academia, too, at UCL. He's a director of the Hay Festival and a trustee of the Roundhouse, um, which was founded by his father. Um, he's currently working on a book called Soul Food, which is the conservative case for arts. Um, David Lammy is um, MP for Tottenham, and um, he served nine years as a minister for... I uh, served nine years in, as a minister in the uh, Labour government, uh, and two of those years as minister for culture, media, and sport. He's an active backbencher and a prospective candidate for London mayor, um, and he's campaigned recently on... <laughs> is that right? <laughs> If, if not... Uh, not confirmed, no. A <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a possibly denied. <laughs> I can only say that was the information one of your aides gave me, no, no. so maybe... <laughs> maybe they're ahead... an intern. <laughs> <laughs> maybe they're ahead of the game on that one. There OK. Congratulations. Let's just slightly draw back from there. That might not be true. <laughs> um, uh, he's campaigned recently on library closures and what he calls Zone 1 bias in government arts funding. I may also add, and I'm afraid this is the intern again, that he's married to a portrait art painter. Is that right? That's Which right. is part that of his right. credentials for debates yeah. on the arts. Yeah. <laughs> John Kampfner uh, is the director of the newly created Creative Industries Federation. Is that right, John? Um, he's also chair of Turner Contemporary, a former editor of New Statesman, um, and former CEO of the Index on Censorship, as well as a long-standing career in journalism for the BBC and for The Independent, which is where he and I worked together many years ago. Anyway, this is the panel, and I'm going to set the hair running with a quote, which is, why don't governments get the importance of the arts? Why are they so lily-livered and evasive? What is it about investment in the arts and the benefits that they don't understand? And I think, John, you might like to uh, said, take up on that. Who said that? <laughs> you said that. Did I? Yeah. <laughs> what, what page <laughs> was it? I mean, I, I absolutely disown it. No, um, and by the way, um, can I answer your question? First, as they always say, politicians, number one, um, do we value the arts? And how should we value the arts more? Uh, what do they contribute? A lot. Uh, and what do they contribute to the national standing? A lot. There you are. End of debate? Can we finish? No, I, I no, think no, we've no. got some time Fine. to fill. Okay, no, governments. <laughs> governments. Um, I look back very uh, briefly to the early days of uh, New Labour when they couldn't bring themselves to utter the words arts or excellence or anything. And they wriggled and they squirmed, and sometimes it was creative industries and sometimes it was creative Britain, but they wouldn't say the arts because it hurt. And they would rather, rather have anything 
than to talk about the arts and to talk about uh, excellence and quality. Now, it took them about eight or nine years to get over it. They did get over it. But it was a sad period, and I think it was a sad period which revealed certain attitudes which I think are still there. That is deep discomfort among too many in the political class, present company accepted, in talking about the arts, A, as if they liked them, good start, B, as if they mattered, good start, C, as if they were worth investing in, that would be a better start, and various other things as well. As for the Tories, I'm now, I think I can best um, exemplify exactly my anxiety about the Tories with a story about Ed Vasey, who I like. That's always a prelude to something very damaging. He said he liked me earlier. But, uh, <laughs> uh, about 18 months ago, he was invited to Covent Garden to see a couple of operas in the ring cycle. He should. He's the Minister for Culture. The following day, I think the Telegraph said, Basie seen going into Opera House. <laughs> Terrible. Everybody panicked. The following <laughs> evening, they, they did, the following evening, we was, my wife and I were sitting in the box. We were. We were invited. I own up. And suddenly I was aware that Ed had come into the back of the box. And I said, Ed, come and sit here. You know, you can see properly. He said, no, no, no. I mustn't be seen. <laughs> now, I'm, you know, I, and where I feel, it, it wasn't confidential, but I feel slightly mean saying that about Ed because he's a very decent person who loves the arts, etc., etc. But what he's reflecting was what the government in general does. They're terrified of the arts and they're terrified of standing up for it. So, there you are. Jesse, would you like to pick up on that in terms of <laughs> criticism of a... Well, thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, thank you, Liz. Thank you, John. Um, I haven't read John's book yet, although I'm, I'm in admiration of the title and I'm, the bit I have read I thoroughly enjoyed. Um, and I'm very pleased to see you using the absolutely classic formula of what was referred to in my school days, in my university days, as the Oxford sandwich, John, consisting of a very small layer of being nice about someone, an enormous fat <laughs> filling of really trashing them, followed by a tiny thin layer of being nice about them again. <laughs> what forward to seeing you soon. One of the, uh, <laughs> exactly, one of the, one of the variants of that being the open face sandwich when you dispense with the initial layer of being nice. <laughs> Later, later. Um, <laughs> um, um, so on this, uh, I, I, of course, um, very much agree with you that um, uh, politicians of all parties don't talk about the arts, and they don't talk about them in the right way. They don't talk about them in terms of passion and imagination and human potential, and they don't recognise the extraordinary effect that the arts can have, cognitive, emotional, therapeutic, communal, social, whatever it might be, on the people who participate in them. And, of course, there is actually an eternity of difference between listening or enjoying going to a show and actually participating in something, acting yourself, dancing yourself, playing music, whatever it is that gives you joy. And so I absolutely ag agree with that. The arts are soul food. That's, I think, what they are. Um, now, why is that? Well, one reason is because, you know, we get the politicians we incentivize. And if the effect of, um, you know, Ed Vasey having a moment where he goes and enjoys Wagner is that he gets completely smeared all over the, you know, even the broadsheet press mm. for his appallingly elitist um, tastes, um, then don't be surprised if uh, in a democratic society he feels a certain incentive not to do that. That's in a way. So part of the problem is our problem, not just as it were um, the, that of politicians or the political class as such. Um, having said that, I do think that there's a deeper, even deeper issue, which we, it's worth just fleshing out for a second, which is why do we have this debased public debate? One reason is because we've allowed a, a certain kind of materialism and economism to overtake our lives. And it's absolutely right that we should be prepared to discuss the dire state of the national finances and that we should be prepared to think about its policy implications. And frankly, let's be clear, we have a phenomenal arts scene in this country and, you know, it doesn't get an enormous amount of state funding and it might be better if it got more, but actually it might not be better if it got more. And there are plenty of countries in Europe, not to say the rest of the world, where there's lots of state funding and have much less exciting and vibrant, uh, interesting places to um, enjoy and practice the arts in this country. So I think there is the, the fundamental issue is why are we allowing this economic, economistic language to take over? Why are we talking in terms of budgets and um, managerial bureaucraties and not in terms of the soul and love and the emotions and the feelings, the things that people really care about and that really get them uh, the purpose and point in the lives that they lead? David, would you like to make your pitch or response to John? and his suggestion that governments of either political hue have uh, not been as supportive as they could be. I'm afraid John's right. Um, just a small bit on myth. 
<laughs> Apologies, like talking about myself. Thirty years ago, uh, I was um, a little lad growing up in Tottenham, and Tottenham was a tough place to be growing up because we just had the Broadwalk Farm riots. There was another little lad in Wales called Alid Jones, who'd got a number one hit with Walking in the Air. My local priest, my primary head teacher, and my mum decided that I could sing and I should apply to cathedral choir schools. I ended up a cathedral chorister at Peterborough Cathedral. That is why I'm here today, because there I discovered excellence. And even though I'm not a singer anymore, that's something that I've been able to deploy across my life. So for me, the value of the arts is that, um, that quest that quest not just for the lifting of the soul, which I think the arts does wonderfully, and I'm very, very lucky to be married to an artist and not a politician, because I go home to great, great art. It is also the possibility of applying yourself day after day or appreciating others that do that, and that quest for excellence. It is a crying shame that we have arrived in a place in Britain where across the political class, what is valued is a PPE from Oxford. And that probably uh, would account for all of our current political leaders. And even though Nigel Farage is passing himself off as something other <coughs> than a banker, uh, he's part of that establishment. And in a sense, it is, it's indicative, I saw this when I was higher education minister, of the way we value the arts generally. Minister for Higher Education, you go into a great university, they do not take you to the English department. They do not take you to the anthropologists and the sociologists. You're, you're going to the economists, um, yeah, principally, the people that got us into this bloody mess that we're in at the moment. Actually, the, the, the thing is, a university, the whole point of a university is interdisciplinary study. Perhaps we wouldn't have had the crash if we'd let some sociologists and some anthropologists and some musicians and some artists into the discussion. So I think there's something going on in our society that's become very instrumental. Um, uh, it, it obviously infects the political class who want to react to. But I think that there is also the arts has found itself in a very, very elitist place, such that politicians are are nervous about lining up to go to the opera or whatever, because in a sense, it's become a very zone one uh, center of London, you know, Islington, Hampstead, Muswell Hill, Hill, it doesn't really matter what hill it is, Primrose Hill, Notting Hill, occupation. And so there is something about how we, um, how we are engaged in the arts beyond that small coterie, if you like, how we value excellence, but how in broader society we get back to a place where we value the arts. Now, let me just, just make a political point. We do <laughs> not do that by no. celebrating taking books away from prisoners. And we do <laughs> not do that. I we do not do that by cutting the, the uh, budgets of FE departments by half. Because the other thing is learning for learning's sake, learning beyond school and that continued quest of it. All of those courses that people used to be able to do, largely subsidised, largely for free, in the evenings, Find me a college that's open past 7 p.m. in the evening. David, I'm just, I'm, I'm just going to draw you back there. <laughs> <laughs> Political point <Good> made. <laughs> um, John, uh, so impartial, I'm, objective observer on this? Or? Well, I mean, not observer, actually doer. What we're trying to do, we're two months into a very large project to um, establish the Creative Industries Federation, which is going to be the embodiment of the concerns that the panelists uh, here have, um, and that um, many, many people um, in the public have too. We're going to be a national membership body um, for all arts, culture, and the creative industries across all the genres, from the one-person practitioner, the two-person dance studio, through to Warner Brothers, Sony, Burberry, um, the Tate, and, and everybody besides. The basic reason for this, and, and um, I, I was asked to do, do this by some senior figures, 
um, in the arts and cultural world is simply the underappreciation of the value and, uh, of arts and culture ar ar across this country. A couple of quick things to say on this. When David Cameron was recently in China, he uh, went on to a social media chat, a Weibo chat, with uh, Chinese young people. Um, and the first question that was put to him is, when is the next, um, episode, uh, when is the next series of Sherlock coming onto TV? And for the British politicians of all colors, when they go abroad, they love to proselytize about British arts and culture, whether it's Doctor Who, whether it's Sherlock, whether it's the, the Tate, whether it's our film industries or everything else besides. When they come back home, they do nothing about it. As John said, they are frightened stiff um, to proselytize. And there are three forms of value. There is intrinsic artistic value. It is what makes us all as individuals and as a society in the best sense of the term richer and fuller. There is great social benefit in the civic spaces and the regeneration of towns and cities. I'm chair of Turner Contemporary in Margate, a very poor town. Since we opened our fantastic art gallery three years ago, we have had one and a quarter million people come to the art gallery. We've just opened a Mondrian show. We have people from around the world. But the stat that I am most proud of is that out of this one and a quarter million people, 5% have never been to any artistic institution, gallery, or museum before in their lives. We're aspiring for excellence, but excellence is not elitist. The two, excellence is, is simply excellent. And what we need to do is to make the case for the intrinsic good. But there is also massive economic benefit to this country. And I'll stop just with a couple of very quick stats. And if this isn't the reason for supporting the arts, it is an extra reason. The basic reason is that arts are good and they enhance our lives. But the rate of growth of the arts and cultural and creative industries is two and a half times the growth of the UK economy. They are growing e extremely fast. The rate of employment growth is six times greater than the economy as a whole. If we just ask yourself this one question. When we had the financial crash of 2007 and 8, if arts organizations, which are predominantly very well run, had run themselves like our banks, do you think they would ever have been bailed out? John, your book is very passionate in its arguments, but it's also underpinned by facts, particularly on the economic side of the contribution the arts makes to Britain generally, to GDP. I'm loath to go into lots of statistics, but would you like to um, expand on that? Just, <coughs> I, it seems, for having read your book, the case is made. Um, I, I couldn't agree more, <laughs> couldn't agree more. Absolutely, stone cold, stone cold. By the way, have you noticed that when Alan Hansen, doing uh, his uh, summaries on uh, Match of the Day, and he says that is a stone wall penalty. He means stone cold penalty. But at some stage, you're sorry, you don't watch a match of the day. I'll shut up. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> um, 700,000 people work in the arts and growing. 2.6 million people in the creative industries. Just about 10% of the GDP. And where one pound is invested in any particular local area, six or seven pounds is, is generated. I mean, the numbers are absolutely enormous. And all this from 0.05 of the national budget uh, percent. 0.05. It will... It might build the, the old, old extra school, certainly wouldn't build a hospital or anything. So number one in the debate is get away from the idea, well, we've got all sorts of essential things to fund, why should we fund the arts? It won't make any difference and you'll do a great deal of damage. Can I just say on values, um, if the arts are said, uh, asked to say, what is the value of the arts? I think the only thing to say to the questioner is, it doesn't have any. What? Well, it's valueless. Of its nature, it is valueless. Now, this is a, uh, it's an extreme defense, but sometimes extreme defenses are useful, because useful, they make the per person ans asking them think again. So, um, if you can't answer a question, what's the value of the arts, just say, sorry, I don't. So, if you want to cut everything I do, because I can't tell you why, why it's worth doing, fine by me. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to pick up on something John said, uh, which was about an underappreciation of the arts by the political classes. But 
it, that's not true of the country, surely. There is a huge appreciation. I know, Jesse, you've written um, about this actually for The Telegraph, mm. um, about an estate up in Scotland in terms of the music um, and what a difference that had made, El Sistema. Yes, I mean, the, the, the truth is that in this country, we, less so now, but historically we've had these amazing music services up and down the country, mm. and they have been a, an astonishing source of joy and all of the virtues that come from playing music individually and collectively. And that system has been allowed to degenerate over time um, uh, uh, for various reasons, but in, in, in including because across parties, governments have failed to fund them properly. And what's happened in Scotland now has been that the astonishing Venezuelan El Sistema has been picked up and developed into a Sistema Scotland with a substantial amount of public funding. And uh, it's, it's, it's mainly focused in Raplock, which is outside Stirling, and it's a phenomenal experiment. And one of the first things that happens to a young person who's involved in Sistema, first of all, everyone is expected to participate. It's not a kind of minority interest for three or four percent of the kids. The second thing is you take a musical instrument home relatively quickly, so you, you, that's something you look after, the benefits and the care and the attention that, as it were, a valued piece of uh, uh, private property then has to be, or, or public property has to be, um, cherished and looked after, and very quickly you take your teacher, your music teacher, home with you to meet your parents, um, if you're one of these young people, and have tea with them or whatever it might be. And, and that's a vital attempt to try to, to reach out into communities that may not be used to or interested in playing music and actually get them to start thinking constructively and creatively about the kinds of things this could do. And it's out of that kind of genius of idea and outreach that you get the David Lammy's going to Peter Brook Cathedral. I mean, that's the joy of it. And I, and, and I absolutely think we should be doing whatever we can to try to extend that line of thought and that feeling of the permeability of music and its ability to reach out across. I mean, look, you know, look at the number of people who go to football games, A. Now compare that to some people who have iPods or other forms of instant access music. I mean, it's, it's a completely ubiquitous. Just John, picking up on yep. that point, and I'm sure it's something that David will want to come in on, and that is ambition for our arts and culture should be geography blind. We are in this country one of the most, and I say this as a, as a proud Londoner, we are one of the most centralized um, uh, countries when it comes, comes to uh, great cultural ambition. And I say this to my colleagues um, who run visual arts or performing arts uh, institutions around the country. If you think you're regional, you will be regional. If you think you're national, and if you act national and international, you will be. If you lived in Germany, you wouldn't say, oh, because I'm in Hamburg or because I'm in Munich, I'm somehow lesser an institution than, I than if I'm in Berlin. You wouldn't say that in the United States as well. Not everything uh, uh, begins and ends with in, in the cultural capital in the States. Uh, in, in New York, in Britain, and this has been a case with public funding, it's massively the case with private philanthropy, that a huge amount of money is concentrated into our great national London-based institutions. And we need to not just raise, raise funding for both public and private, we need to raise the sights and the ambitions of um, our main artistic institutions um, in, in several dozen of our big cities and in our small localities as well. There's some fantastic talent there. And the great problem so often is the best talent just ends up by being sucked into London. And we, we need to create an absolute national UK-wide movement where every town and city has just fantastic institutions. As the potential future mayor of London, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, Did I say uh, mayor and not candidate? <laughs> I apologise for that. We, 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 I, 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 what we wouldn't want to do is give the impression that, say, in Tottenham or Croydon, there's a lot of funding for the arts. <coughs> it is very, very <coughs> centred on a few institutions who I'm sure this audience would know in central London. And, and so, so, so there that, is yeah, this sure. point that, 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 I would do, that, that, that I would agree with. I, I just, uh, just want to tell you, tell you a story. I, I, so I was in government, obviously, with the crash in, in, in 2008 very concerned that in this new economic environment, we would see widespread cuts across the country, which is in fact what we saw. Um, if you're interested in libraries, which I hope all this audience is, a real issue in the country at the moment. And let's also remember, there was a lot of investment in the arts in the, before the crash, 
But my God, the vast majority of it did not come from the government. It came from the lottery. So actually we went back to the public and got them to pay for the arts to fund a lot of the things that we're seeing. And if it were not for the lottery, which is actually an invention of John Major, the arts in this country would be absolutely on its knees. But it is also right to say that paradoxically we're having this debate at a time that is potentially one of great opportunity. The huge move forward in technology, uh, the advances with social media, the nature in which people consume their diet of arts, both literature and, and, and indeed music, is both a threat potentially, but also a great opportunity because there are young people making art as we speak in their bedroom to a degree that we've never seen possible. I'm not sure that that has been fully harnessed and understood by governments. And that relates also to the intellectual property framework in our country, where arts has very much been in the power of a few people. If you're writing a book, it's the publisher. If you're an artist, it's the gallery. You know, those who control the distribution get to control how we then experience the David, arts. can that I just bring in John here? He wanted to respond well, to one uh, of your uh, points, uh, and then we're going to open up yeah. for um, questions. Funding of the arts has typically been, and it's been a very British solution, the tripod, roughly. One third from public, one third from private, one third from box office commercial. Now, in fact, this, the proportion changes slightly and has changed quite a lot in recent years. But it is a good tripod. And the moment somebody says, as um, I think as a danger, as you, you know, Jesse, too many people on your side say, I don't understand why the... Uh, uh, British can't put more of their private money in. We need to shift from public spending and, and, and uh, public support to private support. That's, that's where funding of the arts is going to come from. Number one, it isn't. Number two, it certainly won't in the uh, outside of London. Trying to find um, private support for the arts outside of London is very, very difficult indeed. And number three, the tripod is good. You have three sets of stakeholders, and you have to be responsible to all of them and responsive to all of them. So don't let's throw away that wonderful British model. It's not the European model. It's not the American model. It's the British model. It's a good one. Let's keep it. Thank you. Um, should we go to questions now? Because we have a full house, and I think you have lots you would like to ask. Um, was I, I'm just going to put my glasses on <laughs> so I can see there. Um, you need to have a slide for us, I think. Yes. The lights could come up, yes, please. <coughs> mm, yeah. That's better, right. much better. Gentleman over there, thank you. If you'd like to address your question to a particular um, member of the panel or generally, please it's, it's a general question which arises out of an observation that, that David Lammy made. Um, one of the conspicuous differences between English artistic institutions and American ones is that um, the English institutions don't have the right to deaccession their collections. That's to say, if a painting is given to the National Gallery, it can't be sold because the curator believes that um, the investment would be better placed elsewhere in order to provide liquid capital to refund the gallery. American galleries have a very different model. Um, they can sell their collections because they feel that um, the profile of their collections would be better distributed elsewhere. There is a groundswell um, at an institutional level precisely to deal with Mr. Lamy's point um, about the wealth being concentrated on particular national institutions to move for a bill that does that. And what I was interested in is, does the panel think that's a good idea? Is it a good idea for the Tate to be able to sell um, its constables to fund the acquisition of Damien Hirst? It's a deeply provocative <laughs> subject. <laughs> I'm going to ask each of you if you keep your answers briefly. Uh, brief, uh, John? Uh, no. <laughs> Couldn't have asked for anything better, Jesse? Uh, Maybe I, a little bit of explanation. I, can, I mean, horribly, I can see the argument either way. I, uh, there are some things which, you know, to sell them would be to undermine the character of the institution and to potentially to destroy the collection or value of the collection. There are other ones where, as you know, um, some of our greatest galleries have got paintings smouldering away downstairs which never see never brought up, and those undoubtedly have value, and it might make sense to so sell them those. I mean, our great well, they don't loan them anything like enough. I mean, our, well, that's the, the regional point. circulation yeah. of things. Right, so... so well, I mean, no, Tate has a fantastic program, Tate, which, so, does, which so, does that. So maybe, so maybe the point that's being indirectly raised by the gentleman is yeah. that this would give pressure on those collections to start loaning them more, uh, or face the possible threat of uh, being decessioned by others. That would be an interesting further development. Mm. Thank you, John. Uh, I think it's a terrible idea, and I'll tell you why, um, apart from it being a terrible idea. 
That is that <laughs> just at the time where somebody says, you know, we've got all this stuff done in the basement. Haven't looked at it for 50 years. Isn't it an awful lot of tripe? And within 10 years, somebody says, have you seen that stuff in the basement? It is extraordinary what they were doing 70 years ago, and the entire school has rediscovered. And this happens time and time and time again. You know, just at the moment you want to sell something, whether of your own or in a collection, that's just the moment that you look at it with, with fresh eyes. So please, let's not do it. David? I think that Britain does the balance between modernity and heritage very well. And the danger with this is that the, the current custodians of the institution have a lot of power and can make some fundamental mistakes. So whilst I hear the argument, I'm very nervous about what the repercussions would end up being. Thank you. Another question. Uh, lady at the back. I think it's a lady. Sorry. <laughs> Hello. I'm interested in the Could you use the mic, please? Um, I'm interested in the points that have been made about centralisation, as we have it now, of the arts in London and perhaps Glasgow and Edinburgh. And the elitism that follows through from that. During the war, the arts were spread all over the country. Sybil Thorndike and her husband, Lewis Castle, brought Shakespeare right into the villages of Wales. Um, films were made all over England, celebrated and um, marking the achievements of ordinary people. And I feel that we should recover this atmosphere, this, this wish of everyone to look at art, to listen to art, to see art, not in London, but spread more over the country. And I wonder how we can achieve this. Jesse, I, I, I don't know whether there's an accepted feeling now there's a greater outreach than the, though there has ever been mm. from London to the regions and, and, and the provinces. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, it's, it's, if you live in Herefordshire, you get a very, very thin end of the wedge in terms of your access to the arts. I mean, we've got wonderful courtyard theatre, which runs lots of uh, very wide-ranging and high-quality shows. We've got a museum and art gallery, which is collapsing with a complete absence of funding and is desperately in need of proper... Um, you know, support um, in a historic and beautiful building. So I absolutely feel the concern that is being raised here. I have a, I have a ca caution, though, about um, using the word elitism versus excellence. Um, I, I, my, my experience, and I'm not, this isn't a criticism at all, it's just a general worry, which is that, which is that um, I, I think we should, be, we should be very leery of the word elitism, which is so often a way of cutting people off from something. I would just rather say there's excellence in places and we should make it as available as possible. Yeah. And one of the reasons why London, um, why this centralisation, which has, I'm afraid, got slightly worse in some respects, um, it, it has, you know, one of the arguments in favour of it is precisely that you do get this chimney effect of excellence coming out of it. The real question is, can you replicate that elsewhere? I mean, can, can we get more of that excellence, you know, um, uh, fed when it is in London into other parts of the country so that we get a proper national sense of that, uh, of, of what it amounts to and, and enjoying it? John? I mean, you do, your, your point is entirely right, um, and the centralisation is extremely strong. That said, there are some fantastic examples, particularly in visual arts. I think performing arts is, is to a degree, uh, struggling um, more. But if you're in West Yorkshire, um, uh, the Hepworth Gallery in Wakefield is stunning. Right next to it, the Yorkshire Sculpture Park is absolutely amazing. The Baltic in, uh, in Gateshead, right next to the Sage, um, is, is fantastic. Turner Contemporary, um, the Delaware in Bexhill, I could go on, to Tate St. Ives, Tate Liverpool, the Arnold Feeney in Bristol. There are some fantastic institutions. What um, uh, unites the best outside London is ambition, but also a very, very, the point, um, uh, I, I can't remember if it was David or, or John made, that it is extremely difficult, I think it was John, uh, to get private philanthropy to, um, to add to the absolutely bottom line requirement of public investment. I don't even use the word subsidy or support. It's investment, because you, you are investing in towns and cities and you are enabling them. For every one pound that Kent County Council invests in Turner Contemporary, they get, and nobody uh, locally is disputing the methodology, nine pound 50 back in public benefit. And I could go through that, but I won't now. David, I'm just So sorry. I'm just saying there is a massive amount of good practice and, and good, but it is very patchy. I think, John, that you just did what sort of Londoners can do. Um, you know, you <coughs> reel off the Arnold Feeney, the Baltic, uh, Sculpture Park, yeah. 
My sense is, particularly when I'm in continental Europe, if you're in Spain or if in Italy or France, you can be in the most remote village and the arts is dynamic and vibrant. It, all of us, uh, well, this is a hay audience, so many of us, <laughs> have sat in some village in France in a courtyard and suddenly you realise there's going to be a show, people come out, and you get a sense of that town's heritage and cultural contribution. Somehow, particularly in England, that is not valued, yes. that is not happening, that doesn't get funding. The, am the amateur dramatics gets no funding. The music, the choir gets no funding and no support. It's not valued very much beyond a small group of people. It's perhaps linked also to our modern sense of self, particularly in England. I don't get the sense this is such a problem, say, in Scotland, who might be about to leave us uh, because they feel so... It's a particular thing about what is our identity and why can't we value that complexity of that identity here in England that I think culture plays such an important part of. That's not about the big institution. It's something quite, quite different. It's a very, it's a very bleak picture you point, paint, but um, John, do you agree? Uh, there's mm, something in your book that's very relevant to it, but I... I oh, that's what I say. I wonder what it is. Um, <laughs> no, that, uh, the great institutions, the great institutions, and we really want to be, wouldn't want to be without them, but just a slightly different perspective. Every year, as part of the Claw Leadership Programme, uh, I, we, we interview 75 people, would-be uh, arts leaders, who come from all over the country. And almost every single one of them is engaged in local work, multi-arts work, sometimes educational work, sometimes health work, but always arts-based. And they come from tiny, tiny places. And when I listen to them, at the end of this process, I think... The arts and arts activity is actually much more widely spread, fragile, thinly rooted, at risk, but mm -hmm. much more widely spread than we sometimes think. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So it's not just about uh, the um, inner London postcode. That, that is, that's one thing. It is much more widely spread, and that is, I think, one of the great strengths. That's another bit that I think we could throw into the political debate. Thank you. Perhaps not so bleak then. Uh, questions? Right, we've got lots of them. Gentlemen at the front here, first. It's a bit of a pity that the uh, panel has been constructed so that everyone agrees with each other. Um, <laughs> and I just wonder what the impact is going to be of, shall we say, the UKIP factor, where there is now a substantial proportion of the British population that can no longer be ignored, who frankly do not agree, I dare say, with many of the things that you are saying. And what is the impact that's going to have on the arts? Well, I'm going to ask two politicians uh, here to deal with that very interesting question. Uh, Jesse? I'm not the best <coughs> person on Margaret Farage, come on. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm from a political standpoint, I'm looking forward to that moment where, where David begins his acceptance speech as Mayor of London by saying he's going to push more money into arts in the regions um, in, this <laughs> <coughs> in, in this country. Um, 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 let me just pick up the point you raised. It's very interesting. Um, um, of course, it's absolutely right there is a degree of agreement here. There's also a counterpart argument to be made, but um, which is that, you know, let's be clear, we've just been through this disastrous economic crisis, and the arts haven't blown up in this country. As John said, they remain, albeit thinly rooted, but very active, very engaged, and very successful. So before we throw up our hands at the absence of public funding at a time when public funding has never been under more stress. Let's just remember that aspect of it. Let me take it, if I may say so, take it through a couple of things that you said. Uh, I don't think that UKIP is speaking for an anti-arts working class view, okay? The truth of the matter is that the people who support UKIP are angry with the political system because the political system is not giving them the recognition and the acknowledgement and the understanding that they think are their due. Now, those people may finish that, go home, and sing in their, am, in their local uh, Gilbert Sullivan or their local Am Dram, or, 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 they may, um, or they may go and sing in their local uh, you know, um, uh, working men's uh, choir or police choir, or you know, there may be any number of different things that they may be doing at the same time. I don't want to make this distinction that says somehow that their UKIP supporters, they can't be interested in the arts. Quite the opposite in many ways. Um, I also do think, though, that if you give in to that view, which is to say that that is true, then you're fostering what we are trying to disagree with. 
You know, we shouldn't be saying, we, well, then you would be saying, well, we live in a democracy and some people hate the arts and therefore we should shut up and do what they want. Absolutely not. We should be making the argument for the arts. We should be yeah. taking that as a provocation that we're going to get out there and contest, regardless of whatever class background or, or belief system they may come from. Thank you. David? Uh, I've said enough on Nigel Farage this week. I suppose they might agree with the arts, but they clearly don't want to do it with Romanians is the issue. But <laughs> um, You said it all. Okay, Can thank I just you. Note oh, a sorry, quick Josh. interjection, um, and that is uh, some of the predictions are that Nigel Farage will be uh, will seek <coughs> to become the MP uh, in Thanet, where Margate is based, and we will make the same argument. There are district councillors who switched from the Tories to uh, UKIP, um, and um, the case is still the same case, and I completely uh, agree with 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 Jesse. There aren't two different populations. There is one population. And no matter what they vote, um, there is a very, very strong case to be made for, uh, and I disagree with John on this, for the value of the arts. And the value is intrinsic. It is social. And third, and least, but still important, it is economic. But we'll continue to make that I mean, case. I'll bet you one thing. I'll bet you a pint right now, which is <laughs> if he does become <laughs> the candidate in Thanet, and you say, come to the turn of contemporary, he'll absolutely become. And no, he's, really already, he's already... He's well, there you go. Exactly. <laughs> he's okay. been there. <laughs> Another question. Uh, <laughs> lady there? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's lovely to hear support for the arts here, and of, we see everybody here is, is a supporter, and that's why we're all here. But I fear for the future, um, particularly when we have the new um, vested interest, I'm a drama teacher, uh, new GCSE best eight measures, where drama is not first tier, not second tier, it's actually third tier. It doesn't count Shame. in the best eight. Um, what does that tell our young people <laughs> about the future of the arts, the value of the arts, and when we're talking about the arts being securely rooted in the whole of society, but it's thin, in the future, we're talking about the value being so little that children will not be encouraged to study the arts in school, the value will be non-existent, and then we really do have to worry about the future of the arts, I fear. David, would you like to take that? Because you will already raised the I think it says a lot about Michael Gove, I'm afraid. I, look, I, I find that so depressing. We've all met that, you know, those individuals that, you know, they work in banking, they're lawyers, or the insurance industry, um, and somehow in that office they have lost any sense of who they are. They haven't discovered who they are. They're not on that journey. Do, do, do we really want that for our population? And it's why, and I thank God for our drama teachers. I really, really do. Drama, I love drama at school. It was encouraged in the school that I went to. You know, we, we must not prioritize the more instrumental parts of the curriculum over what is creative and what is self-discovery. And I believe that passionately, and it's a real crime that Secretaries of State for Education have had the kind of power to make these most ridiculous decisions that go against the face, frankly, of our history and wider culture. And when John. And when in the higher education sector, Funding was stopped for the arts and humanities, but retained for the STEM subject. Oh. They yeah. absolutely Shocking. vital as they are, as if there's a difference, you know, as if they don't interact. What what is the signal? The signal was, stay with the STEM subject. Don't do anything as silly as uh, going for the arts and humanities. Um, so you send very powerful signals, and they are just tragically the wrong signals. And one of the one of the reasons <coughs> Britain's creative talent has been so strong over uh, now and over the last ten or twenty years is because of the investment and prioritization we put in primary, secondary, tertiary level in the arts and in arts education. It's no coincidence that we have so much creative talent at the moment. We start pulling the plug on that now, look at ourselves in 10 or 20 years' time, we'll be in a very different place. Thank you. Lady here. Thank you. Uh, when I... Um, I'm in secondary school now, and my uh, school is an arts and technology-based um, school. But we've actually lost that title we, because of lack of funding to our art department. And um, it's something very important to me because I 
you know, I really enjoy art and I really want to push art in schools. But I didn't really start enjoying, I don't think I would have um, started enjoying art until a lot later it with a, without my parents because they're very arts based because there was no art lessons at all in my primary school and there was nothing at all arts based. And I would just like to bring up that um, point because I think it's really important to push that in primary schools to you know, widen younger children's knowledge of arts history and art now. Thank you. Jesse, do you want to take that up? Because I know you'd like to have responded to the yeah, drama yeah, teacher I and mean, lady. Um, I obviously, I can't speak to the situation that you described, which sounds absolutely appalling, and I'm, I'd love to know more about it. I, I do think that um, it's terribly easy um, to just demonise Michael Gove, and, and I'm... Uh, <laughs> it's well, so easy. <laughs> so easy. <laughs> Uh, and, it, and if I must say so, I think it's, it's thoroughly facile as well. Um, the fact of the matter is that, that Michael Gove is a guy who is um, desperately trying to fight a situation in which a quarter of young people come out of school or could come out of school at the age of 16 unable to read and write to a satisfactory standard. Now, how can that be fair? How can that be right? And uh, you may disagree about the means that the government has used by trying to focus on these absolutely critical skills to get on in life. You may feel that um, the balance is wrong, and of course in a very arts establishment you're not going to find many people to disagree with the emphasis that's being placed by the government on science and technology and engineering and things that have historically been somewhat underrepresented in our national life. But let's not get into the casual, facile politics of attacking Michael Gove, who is working every night and day to try and improve, rightly or wrongly, the well-being and the benefit of, the, of, of those young people. And but Jesse, it's not a zero-sum. What? No, 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 hold on a second. I agree it isn't a zero-sum. If one was going to go on and make a, 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 a constructive disagreement, having not fallen into this trap of just yeah, abusing people personally, no, I agree. then I think what I would say is this, that what really matters is the application of human imagination. And the imagination is not something that is restricted to the arts. It is absolutely <laughs> in science and technology and engineering yeah, but we don't trust our things. teachers. Ha there is no imagination. Oh, oh, we want, David, we want curriculum. Try, try not to make as many it's parties. True. Just, just don't. It's not helpful. The, the, <laughs> the scientific... I'll the, come back the, to you, David, now. No, 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 it's no, no, not no, helpful to his argument. No, but it's just... It's just let's, let's, I mean, I want to be fair about this. The, 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 the government has, I think, um, a case to answer as to why it hasn't recognised the effect that the arts can have in... in, in inspiring and enlivening and revitalizing a whole personality in whichever area of, of life it chooses to devote itself, be they science, technology, engineering, or the arts themselves. And that is right. I think it's fair to say that. Do you want to respond? If Jesse was Secretary of State for Education, I'd be more relaxed. Uh, but he's not. Uh, what I see is young people terrorized into jumping particular academic hoops. I see our country's failure, it's still chronic, to invest in technical level skills. I think it was a mistake, I have to say, to get rid of the polytechnics. Mm -hmm. I see further education underfunded. I see libraries closing, and in schools themselves, the example mm -hmm. that we got about drama and the arts is very, very real up and down the country. So, yes, of course, we need young people able to um, uh, read and write, but we also need imagine, imagination and innovation for teachers in how they deploy that. And actually, the arts, both in terms of itself and in terms of its broader contribution to other parts of the curriculum, I think is a key component of that. And much that we set up and funded through schools and the arts was cut literally within the first few months in office, and I'm very. I was I'm very going to. Very I'm going to uh, calm down the party <laughs> political side of it for the minute in favour of more questions from the audience. Um, lady over there. Hi, I'd like to ask about the role of the press in all of this, and if we return to the Ed Vasey point, where um, and the role of the power of the press is undisputed. Have we somehow ended up with a philistine press? which finds it much easier to jeer at playwrights and architects and artists than to support arts and to support a case for them. Um, as, 
John, a former journalist. I want to put on. Oh, John, either John. Yeah, let John. Okay, I bet. John, because I do want to put on record, and this is a very open sandwich. I'm, I really, I, I like Ed Basie, <laughs> and I'm going to get it. He's going to have every right to complain, but the story is true. Um, but yes, I do think that for some reason, and you do have to go back to readers, i.e., all of us, that some newspapers think that. A story about profligacy in the arts, bankrupts in the arts, all those things, which uh, those are pretty few and far between now, much, much harder to come by. So silly stories about the arts still seem to have a currency. I think one of the ways in which they'll have less currency is if people stand up. And when somebody says, why are they, you know, uh, the Matisse, the great Matisse um, cutout of the snail, which is in the penultimate room in the Matisse cutouts. I remember very clearly when Tate bought that, however many years ago, and one paper said, the headline was, you may think this is a load of squares, but we say it's a load of balls. <laughs> now, you know, that's only 30 years, and we have at least moved on from that to saying these, these, are, these are masterpieces. So the press do have a uh, lot to answer for, um, and I think... But unless, unless and until people fight back, and you as politicians certainly know that, if you allow yourself to be beaten to death <coughs> by the press, they'll just go on doing it. So when they say, why do you do it? You say, this is why I do it, this is why I value it, and this is why it's serious. And incidentally, the Turner Prize has managed year after year when people say, look at all this extraordinary stuff, and somebody usually says, yes, the reason we've chosen it is thus and thus, and therefore the debate and the experience about contemporary art advances and gets better. So there's no substitute for standing up and saying what you believe. Thank you. John, do you want to add to that at all in terms of well, a defence or otherwise no, of the I, press? No, I'm certainly not going to defend um, <laughs> uh, my sort of still sl slightly but, but largely former uh, profession. I mean, the record is, is patchy. Newspapers are patchy. Uh, uh, a lot of the more people get their um, uh, news and information uh, from online and still from TV, the BBC's arts coverage. Um, one could criticise certain aspects of it, but is is good and and growing. Um, there are obviously some newspapers who just like to slag off everything, but that's not just um, in the in the arts arena. Can I just very quickly give you one little anecdote, and it's actually about local um, uh, responses and local press. And I'll just bring it back to Margate, but it, I think it would have uh, it would have national. Uh, I'm sure uh, lots of other um, institutions would have the same thing. When we were negotiating for, uh, with the council for our three-year um, uh, funding, uh, they uh, gave a 7% cut against their own cut of 30% from national government. They were facing terrible cuts um, to children's services, libraries, everything else. This is a conservative council, big C, and in some ways, small c. They've acted incredibly bravely. So 7%, we didn't want that, we, we didn't want to cut at all, but um, we, uh, we put up with it. The council leader said to me, please don't, when I'm going to go on local radio and do newspaper interviews, please don't gloat that you've got away with it, which I thought was a strange way of uh, looking at it, because I'm going to get a kicking. He did get a kicking. He got the other form of kicking. People went on to the local radio and they wrote to the local newspaper saying, why are you cutting the one thing in the area that works? So politicians often wrongly second-guess public opinion, and they often wrongly second-guess um, the, uh, the press. There is actually, if you make the case, and if you're brave in making the case, you can actually win public, far more public support <coughs> than if you simply pander to the lowest common denominator. Thank you. Um, one more question I think we probably have time for. Any hands? Gentleman over there? We'll try and get two in. Yes, there are five of you there, one of them a representative from Hereford. You've mentioned England and Scotland and Margate. I just wondered if you had any comments wow. about Wales. <laughs> <laughs> Who'd like to answer that question? Go on, Jesse, you're the local. Well, of course, um, we, we are in Wales. We're also in the Marches, which is neither England nor Wales. And so I'm very happy to argue the case of the Marches just as vigorously as I, as I do the case for, for Hereford. Um, and if Roger Williams were here, I know he'd do exactly the same thing. Um, I think the point is this, that wherever you are in that space, in that area, you are suffering a dire absence of access to um, uh, uh, the kind of um, art that would be naturally expected in even a modest size um, uh, city. And 
we need to try to change that, and we need to use whatever methods we can to do it. The truth of the matter is that funding in London is roughly 15 times what it is per head um, in our part of the world, and we don't have many people in this part of the world, so it doesn't amount to a lot of money. Um, and um, uh, it, of course, public funding isn't the only problem. It's rightly been pointed out that private funding is part of the issue as well. Um, and frankly, we're just incredibly lucky to have institutions um, of which we're sitting in one as we speak, which do as much as they do to enliven. I'm a director of the festival. I can tell you we get almost no public money, and we put on a bit of a show every year. People seem to enjoy where they come from. That seems um, a perfect way and moment to end, I'm afraid. I'm getting the red light here, so I'm going to have to draw it to a close. Thank you very much indeed for your great questions, and I'd like you to join with me in thanking our panel, David Lamy, John Tusa, Jesse Norman, John Campbell. Thank you very much.